Hello and welcome to a new interview from MinMax. MinMax is a place about games, friends getting better. My name is Ben Hansen. Thank you for being here. Today's interview is with the legendary game creator Noah Falstein, who has been in the industry for over 40 years, going back to working on arcade games like Sinistar at Williams, working a little bit on Joust as well. Maybe best known for their work at LucasArts, working on games like Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, and specifically as the co-designer and co-story lead for Indiana Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, which we just did a huge community game club discussion on. You can find it on this YouTube channel if you're so inclined. Uh, so in this interview, we talk about all of those good things, what it's like to work at Skywalker Ranch. We talk about what it was like to work with George Lucas, what it was like to work with Steven Spielberg going on even then into DreamWorks Interactive with Spielberg. He also journeyed over to Google eventually, where he was the chief game designer, saw the earliest phases of Stadia. So we talk about the Sad collapse of Stadia overall there and what he's learned from working with big companies like that. And of course, we talk about Monkey Island. Noah is in the credits for Return to Monkey Island. So we talk about that process of coming back to the project after so long, just in a consulting capacity, working with his old friend and the person who he hired, Ron Gilbert. So we talk about the earliest days of developing Monkey Island and Return to Monkey Island as well. Heads up, there are some loose spoilery things for the original concept for the secret of Monkey Island back in the day. So there are timestamps below for your convenience if you want to jump to a specific topic or if you want to dodge anything in particular. And if you enjoy the fact that there are those timestamps and you enjoy the fact that this long form interview exists, you can help thank us. Uh, it's very easy by just subscribing to MinMax's YouTube channel. We'd appreciate that. Any help telling a friend about this interview is appreciated. And if you really want to help support us, you can go to patreon.com slash MinMax with two N's. If you support us at that $5 tier, you unlock the podcast version of this interview and all of our other interviews and the deepest dive on Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, which is hours and hours and hours and hours of a fun conversation about a very fun old adventure game. Uh, but without further ado, here's Noah Falstein. Noah Falstein, welcome to MinMax, sir. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. I love you have the Fate of Atlantis poster behind you. You're, you're ready to go. You know what this conversation is going to be like. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, we just took um, as a community uh, the deepest dive where we had the best, most thorough discussion about Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, at least we think possible, where a bunch of us played through it for the first time and played through it with the community. Everybody submitted hundreds and hundreds of comments and we sorted through all that stuff. Um, are you sick of talking about Fate of Atlantis at this point? Oh, not sick about it. Uh, you know, it's it's been popular and it's really nice to have that. And uh, I think... With the pandemic, there was a lot of interest. I, you know, I had a lot of um, small podcasters just, you know, looking for things to do. So its interest has picked up, and retro gaming seems to be going stronger than ever. So it's all great. Yeah, that's interesting. So in the pandemic, everyone's maybe feeling a little bit nostalgic. Like we have the time. What's the right genre? It turns out it's adventure games from 1992. Well, you know, especially Germans are our, our games for some reason sold better in Germany than any other country, at least per capita. And uh, we, we constantly get, um, you know, all of us who worked at LucasArts in those days get uh, mobbed when we're in Germany. It's, it's pretty cool. So you're just like the Beatles when you're playing lands on the tarmac in Germany? I, well, it's more like, I, I, this is a very dated reference, but like Jerry Lewis in, in France, you know, it's like, yeah. well, maybe not that big in your home country, but hey. It's <laughs> <laughs> a place to be. Well, uh, I'd love to unpack all that stuff from the olden days, obviously. But yeah, what is your life like these days? Are you still doing consulting or what's like your day to day out there? Yeah, so I'm basically mostly doing advising and consulting in the mixture of games and healthcare, which is a uh, you know, fairly new thing, but uh, I've been doing it on and off for the last 20 years. And it's, you know, in fact, also, I think partly due to the pandemic, any kind of remote uh, digital healthcare has become a lot more popular. So it's uh, uh, cool stuff. You know, I, I worked on the first game, so far the only game that's been uh, cleared by the FDA so that doctors are currently prescribing it. Uh, it's, it's for ADHD. Oh, really? What does that gameplay actually look like then? Well, it's it's a real high intensity kind of racing game, and it's actually if you're you know neurotypical, which is the the politically correct term for you know a standard wired brain, it feels too hard to play. But people with ADHD uh, either you know they they have a higher bar than most of us, and that once they get into something, 
they're really intensely focused, but you need a higher level of intensity, and that's what the game delivers. And it basically teaches them to retrain their brain so that they are better at paying attention selectively to things. Yeah. Are you interested in that field just because it it feels like it has the most room to grow? Like we haven't quite tapped the potential of combining medical needs and uh, games? Well, that's a big piece of it. Uh, I mean, it's it's that's, I think, one of three things that has drawn me to it. Um, another one is that it's just a great design challenge that uh, I have to use everything I learned making entertainment games and designing them. But there are a whole new set of constraints. And sometimes it gets really weird as to what you have to do in one of these games. One of the games, we have a little three degree field of vision that's this tiny circle that you have to play part of the game in because it's a vision-oriented game, for example, and making a fun game that fits into a circle that's, you know, even in today's higher resolution, like 40 pixels wide is uh, really challenging. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm still fascinated by your day-to-day life. People call you out of the blue. They say, hey, come do our German podcast. They say, hey, come consult on these <laughs> games for doctors. Um, are other people still calling you up for consulting? Yeah, I mean, I do a little bit of entertainment stuff, which is, I guess, normal games. But uh, uh, at this point, it's been so popular to do the healthcare stuff that it's really become my main focus. And I mean, being in the games industry, so it's been nearly 43 years for me. And all of my friends who have stuck with it, you know, for around that amount of time, have had to reinvent themselves multiple times because the industry just keeps changing, you know, the technology, the types of games, all that sort of thing. So if you don't love change, then, you know, you, you probably haven't stuck with it that long. Yeah. And, you know, I, I may be doing something totally different in another five years. Yeah. It's always evolving. Um, I gotta say, it was exciting to see your name at the end in the credits for return to monkey Island. Uh, that must've uh, been a bizarre delight. project for you. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it, those of us at LucasArts back in those those early days, back when it was Lucasfilm Games in particular, uh, most of us have stayed close friends. And um, David Fox, who was the lead programmer on that, is um, you know we see each other all the time. We live near each other, and uh, he was. I mean, they all the whole team was amazing. I knew that David and and you know Ron were working on something, but never had a whiff of it being a Monkey Island game, really? and I just assumed that that was never going to be possible. So it was just great to you know when he asked me to come on and test it, I just it blew my mind. Okay, the abbreviated version. What is your history with Monkey Island? I mean, were you there on day one? How involved with you were you with the original games? Uh, so I, I guess my my biggest contribution is that I. Uh, hired Ron Gilbert to work on uh, Coronas Rift, the the first game I published at LucasArts. And uh, he went on to do some cool stuff, you know, including hiring Dave Grossman and Tim Schaefer into uh, LucasArts. So I think that chain is is big. But yeah, I was um, not part of the core team, but we were all very collaborative. And I, I've got a, credits on the first two Monkey Island games. Um, in fact, Monkey Island 2 is my favorite all-time credit, which is... Uh, goofy pun consultant. So I guess even back then I was doing consulting. <laughs> I love it. Uh, what was your perspective on the development of those early Monkey Island games? I mean, certainly the, the kind of folklore development is, oh, you know, they were working really hard making this adventure game. Then they had some placeholder text and they said, you know what, actually this placeholder text is more fun than anything we could actually write. Let's roll with it. Was it seen as kind of the, the oddball project back in the day or the adventure snobs at uh, Lucas looking down on it or what was the tone? Oh, not at all. No, I mean, uh, we all had a lot of respect for Ron. He really, um, you know, he made the scum engine. So it'd be hard to, if, if you had any kind of uh, contempt for that, you wouldn't want to show it. But I think everybody <laughs> was generally pretty good. He and, he and Brian Moriarty sometimes had some polite feuding and the, the whole ask me about Loom thing. Some people think it was a marketing deal in, in Monkey Island, but it was as much Ron kind of making fun of Loom and, um, you know, Brian trying to ignore it and, and rise above it. <laughs> Do you feel like Ron still, uh, looks up to you as the person who hired him? Is it still all these years later baked in that like, oh, well, no, it's the the elder statesman here? Well, I like to think, I mean, I I wouldn't say that so much. I mean, he's had an amazing career and, you know, certainly eclipsed a lot of what I've done with um, uh, running studios and stuff. Uh, But Ron and I have always had a particularly good um, resonance in our brainstorming and creative work. And uh, I just consider him, uh, you know, out of everybody in the world, I think I, I... get more mileage out of brainstorming with him than anyone else. And you know, it's kind of like old married couples where we just know what the other person's thinking and, you know, can save a huge amount of time because you don't have to explain stuff. 
Yeah. So what was that like when they called you up to be brought in to return to Monkey Island? Oh, it was, it was uh, just, you know, ideal. For one thing, I was amazed that he had finally had a chance to do it. And, uh, you know, for we'd all given up that Disney would ever, you know, pass the rights on or make it possible. Yeah. And uh, Craig Derrick there, I have to give credit to. I, I've met Craig. We've we've talked about other possible revival projects that may still happen. Mm-hmm. So I can't can't discuss those. Um, he's very big on it. Uh, the the critical success, at least of, of return, I think, uh, it was going to help uh, possibly make some of those happen. Um but I think the thing that most impressed me at first, certainly, was started playing the game. And I knew Ron had always said that he wanted to start where Monkey 2 left off. And I liked the way he ended it um, for reasons that I think are gradually becoming more apparent now. But a lot of people, it was in, in some top 10 lists for worst ending ever. Um, because a lot of people just felt it was kind of a, oh, it was all a dream thing. Right. Um, but here, I'll give you a... a not exactly a scoop because Ron has talked about this publicly, so I can, but it's the first time I've talked about my perspective. Because I was you know, with Ron in the very early days of the first secret of Monkey Island, I was there when I knew what the first secret was. And all these years until just the last few, um, you know, last month when he's been doing interviews, you know, I, I was keeping it to myself what he had told me because he was being really careful about not letting it out. Right. And the basic concept, I guess the easiest way to look at it in today's context, it was a lot like the, the Westworld TV series. He wanted um, Guybrush, you know, gradually you start to look, see these weird anachronisms and gradually realize that he's in some kind of uh, theme park. Um, in fact, early on, there was like a dragon that he finds is like, what the hell is a dragon doing here? And then it gets even weirder because the dragon is mechanical and you have to break into these underground um, sort of uh, passages to find the controls. And that's what happens at the end of Monkey 2. You know, it's not exactly that, but those were both references to his original concept. And, you know, now all these years later, He's had, you know, so many guesses, and I think he does a great job in this game of kind of sewing it all up as to what the secret is. Yeah, it's such a rare instance where people have been bugging him for all these years about what's the secret of Monkey Island? Just to have, like, the perfect MacGuffin for your legacy sequel to come back to. And, like, I love Virgin of Monkey Island, and the fact that it's still so compelling. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I do want to see the secret, and now I'm <laughs> confident that it's going to be revealed at the end of this game, and it just, I think it's uh, masterful. I think it's its so brilliantly done and unfurled in that game. Um, but uh, so, consulting on that game, then, do you remember big pieces of feedback that you had? Were certain things surprising when you actually got your hands on it? You mean the first game or the I'm return? sorry, Return to Monkey Island. Uh, no, you know, the, the, uh, the, the reality is that, I mean, I, I started um, testing it back in say, January or February of this year, uh, and it was still, I would say, 80% of the artwork was black and white sketches and little signs saying animation here, that sort of thing. But, uh, and there was basically no voice the very first one I played. Um, but the puzzles and the writing were about 90% of the way there. And that really was my, my main focus, you know, with working with Ron, working with Dave Grossman, both in those days and, and subsequently. Um, I've done a lot of work in interactive storytelling and writing. And uh, that was really my main you know, focus for it all. And the reality was, it was just great. I I mentioned a few kind of tuning tweaks of puzzles that I thought were a little too hard or hints that were a little too subtle. Mm. Um, and uh, the rest of the time, it was a little embarrassing because I kept gushing about how much I was enjoying it. So, uh, <laughs> you know, didn't have a whole lot I could actually do to affect it. But, you know, it was really nice to be back with the gang again. And, yeah. and the music guys, you know, we oh. hired all three of those guys around that time of monkey Island and were blown away about how good they were, you know, 30 some years ago. And of course they've all just matured and done even better since then. Yeah. Playing that game. Did it make you think like, am I still this good? If I was directing a game right now, could I make something as good as return to monkey Island? <laughs> well, you know, I it didn't think of it in that way, but now that you've mentioned it, it's given me a, a, a terrible um, uh, imposter syndrome on that. So <laughs> I think I could say I absolutely would not be as good as Ron was in doing this. You know, for one thing, he's kept in, in practice a lot more than I have on adventure games. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, in other interviews, Ron Gilbert said that 
he doesn't know if he would want to make another Monkey Island after this. He might want to pass the torch. Would you ever want to be more involved? Would you ever want to pick up that mantle to kind of have some of that old school? Yeah, I mean, Ron and I, when he was running uh, Cave Dog Entertainment, um, he and actually he and Dave Grossman and I collaborated on some concepts and Ron and I collaborated on a concept subsequent to that. Um, And they were not pure point and click adventure games, but sort of evolutions of what we thought they might get to. And that was now 20 years ago. So if we tried to revive any of those ideas, they'd I'm sure be reworked completely. But I just, you know, I love working with those guys. Very happy to do it again. Um, Dave Grossman and I collaborated on a revival of um, a Leisure Suit Larry game of, of all things for uh, high voltage software right. and went through a bunch of design work on it. And then they ended up killing the project before it launched. So that never saw the light of day. God, what era was that? Oh God, that would have been about 15, 17 years ago, something like that. They uh, high voltage did a Leisure Suit Larry game. They got the license from Sierra. They did one game and it was not very successful. And they said, this doesn't feel like the old adventure game. So they brought Dave and me in to, um, you know, kind of give it that touch. And we had a great time kind of going through it and juicing it up and introducing them to uh, Ron's invention of um, uh, diagrams, puzzle uh, uh, flow diagrams that he uses that you know was, were basically created for Maniac Mansion, and that we've refined. Um, you know, all of us who who worked with him have refined them in our own ways. Uh, Hal Barwood and I did our own versions for both Fate of Atlantis and a subsequent game we did for a German publisher. Yeah. Um, so, what does that mean exactly? What are the what are these diagrams? How do they work? So they um, they look like regular flowcharts. Uh, but there's a couple secrets. For one thing, you start from the end of where you want to be and you work backwards. And for another, the points in the flowchart are not things that the player does, but um, keys to the next part, uh, sometimes literally. So that, for example, it wouldn't be find the key to the door. It's that this key unlocks the door. And the next thing before that was search for the key. Uh, and the thing before that was uh, this character tells you that there's a key to unlock that door. So you kind of build the structure of the puzzles up by the tasks that the player has to accomplish. And it's hand in hand as you're working usually from the front of the game to the end with a storyline. Uh, you know, and sometimes, you know, I've in, inevitably you change a lot of stuff along the way. And here's a great idea for a puzzle. Let's change the story so it, it fits you know, here's a really interesting thing that happened in the story. Can we make a puzzle out of it? Yeah. Do you, um, every time there's a big new adventure game releasing, are you just crossing your fingers and just studying the response to it? I mean, with like, you know, Double Fine's Broken Age, are you just analyzing every second of that to be like, how is the audience going to react to this? Uh, you know, I, I love the adventure games, but, um, you know, I personally have kind of moved on myself and, uh, I do. I did follow, in fact, uh, Broken Age and you know several others. That you know, one of the things I, I love is that back at a GDC award ceremony, um, this was God a long time ago, maybe 20, 23 years ago. Um, I was hanging out with a bunch of my old Lucas Arts buddies at a table at the award ceremony. And we met um, Dave Gilbert, who uh, went on to do, you know, those a lot of the modern adventure games. Yeah. But he was getting an award for, I think, his very first um, adventure there as one of the, the cool ones. And it, what was really fun about that is that it just blew him away. I, I might have been the one who met him. And he said, oh, yeah, I admire all those games you guys did. And I said, oh, come on over. And you could see, you know, it's, this was, oh, my God, these are these are my idols who made all the games that inspired me to do this. And, I, you know, it's it's such a close knit community. Everybody was matter of fact about it and loved what he had done. Yeah. And of course, now he's gone on to, you know, have a huge success in his own right. So, yeah. With um, budget. It, so it seems more to me like it's, you know, helping the next generation rather than, uh, you know, I, 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 I personally don't like it. You know, there are some people who make one game and spend the rest of their career just doing remakes of that game over and over again. And that's never appealed to me. Yeah. Despite everybody wanting to constantly bug you and talk about Lucas stuff. <laughs> yeah. Despite that. And then be, trying to be drawn into it now and then. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, just since you've had such a, a wild, uh, long career in the game industry, starting out in the arcade space, I'm working on Sinistar. I got to ask. 
Did everybody on the Sinistar team think it was badass? Like, that his voice was cool? Was he metal, or was it just like, this is fun and silly? What was the tone of the team for Sinistar? Oh, no, it was definitely, you know, we thought it was really cool. I mean, for one thing, it wasn't the very first arcade game to have voice in it, but it was like one of the first five, and it was the first one to have a real character where the voice kind of gave you a sense of that. Um, And even with Sinistar, you know, we had, I think, a total of about, 15 seconds of voice that we could fit into the chips at that time. Um, but it was done. Uh, we had this, this guy is uh, sadly passed away now, uh, uh, primarily an artist and designer called Python Angelo. Um, and there's his, his given name. Uh, and he sought out this local announcer in Chicago, who was a TV uh, announcer. And he just thought his voice was perfect. And it was, I mean, he just did a great job. Uh, and we all thought it was wonderful. The, the one thing he couldn't do is that we we had something in there of roar of Sinistar. And I wish that we had kept those uh, cassette tapes because everything else, he just nailed it. But when it came to the roar, you could hear him talking to Python in the, the booth saying, you want me to roar? Like, like what? And, you know, it's just, just like a monster. Kind of, so he goes, Arr! and it was just terrible. And they ended up going to the local zoo, uh, Brookfield Zoo, and recording a lion roaring and then doing a little digital tweak on it for Sinistar. That's funny. Whose idea was it to call the player a coward, (laughs) which is awesome? (laughs) Um, You know, I don't recall exactly where that came from. Um, You know, my friend RJ Michael, who I I hired for that project, actually brought him into the games industry. And he has since hired me back. You know, I I worked at 3DO with him and uh, Google. He was my, my boss. Um, but he has uh, publicized the fact that that Run Coward, when it came out, he just re- was reminded of Ron Howard, the yes. uh, the actor. Um, but I think it might have been John Newcomer, who was the original designer on what was then called Juggernaut, that he handed off to me to complete it as Sinistar. Uh, he did a lot of the creative work. He was the first full time game designer I ever met in in my career. Yeah, since um, you have credits on Joust, right? I just, I did a little testing, you know, okay. more or less like what I did on Monkey Island. It was my way. I, I just started in the company when they were in the last stages. And that was a good way to come up to speed on how everything worked. Yeah. Um, I'm always just fascinated by that connection between Joust and like Nintendo's balloon fight. Um, and I'm just curious, like, uh, what was your perception, the team's perception of the early days of Nintendo in the arcades? Was it a slow burn before you realized, like, wait a minute, something, some talents truly building over there? Well, you know, I, Williams was so early, this was 82, 83, that Nintendo hadn't even really penetrated to the, the U.S. I mean, the, the closest we got was uh, Donkey Kong and, um, you know, the, the early brilliance of Shigeru Miyamoto, but uh, we didn't even know by name anybody there. Yeah. So it wasn't until they, the, the whole division, the group I was in, I, about 90% of it was laid off after the big crash in 83. Um, and they kept on a handful of people that, that stuck with it. But I stayed in touch with those people remotely mostly, but it's not like we got together to, to talk about Nintendo. Yeah. Um, I know that in general, we were actually planning a home game um, uh, division within Williams uh, because the, of the rise of popularity of uh, Commodore 64 and some of the other home computers at that time. But that uh, kind of fizzled before it was able to, to launch. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, all right. Your time working out of Skywalker Ranch. <laughs> um, I am fascinated by this, obviously. Um, do you, what do you think about when you think back on those days? Is there something that you just can't quite, uh, solve in your head? Is there an era you constantly think back on just reflect upon? Well, I mean, it's a real golden age. I mean, I think everybody who worked there, you know, certainly in the games group was just blown away by it, that uh, there was a bit of a controversy within the internal Lucasfilm uh, email and and Lucasfilm, because of the people that went on to later become the graphics group and spun off as Pixar, had a lot of uh, uh, just pioneering computer guys. So we were online and on email and on the internet before it was the World Wide Web back in the early 80s. but the very first people who started working at the ranch were some of the support staff, the um, clerical support staff, some of the secretaries and, and accountants. And one of the secretaries published this thing saying, what drives me crazy up here is that the gravel walkways they have are ruining my high heels. And 
Meanwhile, the people at ILM were basically in the slums of, of San Rafael, um, you know, which is the, the city I live in now, but it was just this really rundown area. It's still actually the sort of poorest, kind of most beat up area. And they're just fuming over people complaining about their high heels or at one point, they, they, the gourmet chef that George had hired to do lunches there um, was forbidden from providing mayonnaise uh, to dip our artichoke leaves in because one of the people who all will remain nameless, who was high up, had a bit of a weight problem and didn't want to be tempted by watching other people eat it that way. <laughs> and so there was a bunch of outrage about that. And the people at ILM started posting things about, oh, I know how you feel when, you know, I have to pick the third roach out of my sandwich at the local place. <laughs> I think, you know, why can't they keep just one or two roaches per sandwich? This, is that kind of thing. This is what fascinates me. It is a dream scenario, a dream working environment, and still naturally office politics will seep in. It'll start oh, to sure. eat itself apart. I mean, I know you've referenced that, you know, by the end of your era there, office politics were not exactly pleasant. Um, is there any way to create a paradise for a working situation or even if you're at skywalker ranch is it just natural that eventually things will crumble well uh, you know it's an interesting question i think that there's a lot you can do to make really good working spaces but skywalker was uh, you know uh, maybe not one of a kind you know there uh, i've been to wet a workshop in new zealand yeah and it certainly has many aspects of that of some super creative people and also uh, cross uh, um, uh, crossing the lines between computers and film and storytelling and technology. Uh, places like that certainly exist. Pixar currently has elements of that. But the thing I think, uh, several things about Skywalker Ranch that would be really hard to ever recreate um, were that it it's way out in the middle of nowhere. So it's in this beautiful valley. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard. I mean, even at the time it was controversial because it took a lot of people a long time to commute there. Uh, we, we had, they gave us free deer whistles to put on our car that sent out this high pitched sound because a lot of people were, you know, having deer run across the road and, and collide with them. Um, so that was something, uh, the Star Wars mystique, particularly back in the 80s when it was brand new, it's, it's hard to imagine now because Star Wars is still big and now you have Avengers, but that was like the only thing of its kind that was at that level back then. And there we were at the heart of it. And um, the quality, it was it was only a couple hundred people that ever have worked at the ranch because they, they were zoned so they couldn't expand too much. So it was really small and places like Pixar or when I was at Google years later, have you know huge numbers of people so you don't have that same private uh personal feeling i mean and george had a lot of his artwork um maxfield parish stuff uh oh the guy that does um old western uh themed sculptures i'm forgetting his name but famous artists doing their sculptures their paintings and they're all up there for us to see i mean in my office i had on the wall a um uh, one of the original uh, concept art for the first Star Wars movie where Luke Skywalker is looking down on Mos Eisley. Um, but if you look closely, Luke is actually a female. You get to see, you know, that the, the shape of the character is a woman because for a while the idea was that it would be uh, a girl first and then they, they did the whole thing with Leia instead. I hope that's not a spoiler for anyone who hasn't seen the first <laughs> Star Wars movie. Well, is it, do you think that was just Ralph McQuarrie drawing it that way? Or do you think Lucas originally Oh, had no, no. It was definitely in the original, his Journal of the Wills thing. There were some ideas yeah. about, uh, yeah, all of uh, McQuarrie's uh, original artwork that was based on stuff that, that changed quite a bit before they got it out. That's wild. Um, I remember hearing in an interview with you once that George Lucas didn't want you all to have blinds on your windows <laughs> working in there. Yes. <laughs> what is that yeah, strategy? So, well, this is part of the thing. Skywalker Ranch was as much a uh, show place and a sort of, he did storyboards to to work out the ranch just like he did for movies. And he had a whole fictional story 
of a, a sea captain from New England retiring to California and deciding to, uh, you know, bring having children there and starting a vineyard. And each of the buildings fit into that story. And what? they were supposed to be built. Oh, it was amazing. Uh, it, the big tech building where they do, we, we have a 300 seat, have had a 300 seat theater um, and uh, all the post-production sound stuff was meant to be a 1920s era, um, you know, pre-prohibition uh, winery. And so it was all done in an Art Deco, Art Nouveau style that was popular in the 1920s. And so each of the buildings had their own era it was supposed to be made in, and it was constructed to make like it, it could have been 100 years old, but it's all brand new. And, and the premise was this is the journey of the sea captain's life? It was just to have a setting so that it was not just, hey, let's have some nice buildings, but let's build it like we build our movies. I don't think I'm sure there was a name for this guy. It was it was more to have a theme. Okay. And I, I would give tours to friends. And one of the things that was always got them confused is we talk about this sea captain that came over in the 1880s or whatever and built this this house. And they say, how did he put in Ethernet cables back then? And it's like, well, no, this was all built three years ago, but that's the story. And <laughs> it's very confusing for people that way. What a mess. And part of that vision was there can't be blinds on the windows. Well, he, he didn't like the way that blinds looked. But of course, we're using computers and we have sunlight hitting the screens and it was just impossible. And so instead of just some curtains, he specifically went through a whole bunch of stuff and picked out some wooden slat blinds that felt appropriate to the era that we, you know, our I particular see. building was, was, yeah, it was just uh, little things like that. And, and by the way, the, the secretaries finally got their gravel stuff paved over with uh, uh, a cement walkway so they didn't ruin mm. their high heels anymore. All right. I guess that's fine. Uh, do you remember your first meeting with George Lucas? Yeah. Um, well, what was interesting is that, so there are two sides to that. He was and is not a gamer, but he just believed in the potential he had. And over the course of a given year, for the first several years I was there, he would put in, I would say, a total of about eight hours per year with our group. And, you know, almost all of his time at ILM and working on the movie stuff. And, you know, we felt a little short change, but we were so happy to be there. It was no big deal. And then um, Steven Spielberg, who is a hardcore video gamer and just loves games, um, threw out an idea actually to Ron originally when Steven Spielberg was calling Ron for hints on uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And, you know, the, the project leaders alternated at, at, at intercepting his hint calls so that uh, he didn't have to go through the normal uh, paths. And he told Ron, yeah, I, I had this idea for an Amazing Stories uh, TV episode, but it got too complicated. I think it might make a good game. And that was the basis of The Dig. Yeah. Um, and I was the first project leader on The Dig. I got to run uh, brainstorming meetings that both George and Stephen had. And with his pal Stephen there, George was 100% in. And I spent more time with him in my first meeting on the dig than I had in the, you know, six years I'd been there before that. So it was all kind of relative. Yeah. And you feel like he believed in the power of games, even though he didn't play a lot himself just because he was buddies with Spielberg and Spielberg was maybe relaying some of that enthusiasm to him. No, no, on the contrary. Uh, it was, I give George full credit for seeing a lot of what digital technology was going to be in the future that mm. currently on uh, Netflix, I think there's no, it's on Disney plus. Of course, there's a, a series about ILM yeah. called um, light and magic. I think uh, very much. I mean, it was very nostalgic for me. And in fact, I've had a couple of people caught, you know, the the literally two seconds where my picture is on the screen in, a, in, in just a still photograph. Yeah. Um, but that was our era when the game stuff was starting up. And George believed in video games and computer graphics in video editing. And he was ahead of his time for all that stuff. Uh, video editing in particular, where he was like 10 years ahead of where everybody else was. Um, but he was just right about that and just was fervent about it. And even though Steven loves games, it wasn't until when I went to DreamWorks, partly so I could work with him some more, it wasn't until DreamWorks Interactive that he ever was directly involved with his own company actually making video games. Yeah, yeah. So from those brainstorming sessions uh, on The Dig, what did you notice about their... Um 
brainstorming sensibilities between George Lucas and Steven Spielberg? How did it differentiate? I mean, we kind of, yeah. we're very lucky we can see a glimpse of it from the transcription of their early Indiana Jones meetings, if you really want to geek out and read that. But yeah, I'm curious just on your perception of how those two interacted with each other and well, with other creators. I think the cool thing was, it was uh, both humbling, but also very reassuring and reassuring in that they are, you know, just nerds like the game guys are. They're film nerds, but it was that same enthusiasm and encyclopedic knowledge of what's come before and just having fun doing their thing. You know, I love that. Um, and also, like the rest of us, they would throw out, you know, this is part of where I learned really good brainstorming, throw out lots and lots of ideas, and only a portion of those were any good. The thing that was a little humbling is that I would say maybe one in three of their ideas was really good. And uh, with what I was doing at the time, I was very lucky to hit one in 10 where I was happy with them. <laughs> um, but in fact, Ron was in at several of those meetings as well, um, partly because I, I liked the chemistry and I, I wanted his ideas too. And also Stephen really liked what he had done um, you know, with, with his early adventure games. So uh, one of the things that really, um, made me very proud is like uh, three or four years after this, um, some people, uh, uh, when I was working at, at 3DO, some people ran into Spielberg at the Consumer Electronics Show, and he was uh, talking about video games. And he said, oh, you know, you should hire um, Ron Gilbert and Noah Falstein because they're the best game game people in the industry. And my friend who was there, I wasn't at the show, came back and told me that he didn't know that I was already working for them. Oh, wow. But it was, you know, one of my highlights. To, you know, if Steven Spielberg thinks that you're doing a good job in your creative work, it's uh, high praise. <laughs> yeah, I know we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, DreamWorks Interactive, I'm curious how you reconnected there and, and how that whole thing launched. Well, uh, so I, I had been out of LucasArts for a while, um, started actually some of my consulting work and did a, a bunch of other projects. And then I saw the announcement that DreamWorks was starting up and that they were going to have an interactive group. Um, and I immediately actually had a Hollywood agent at that time for about a year and a half. I tried that and, you know, had certain advantages, but they just weren't ready for games and, and supporting games at that point. But this guy knew how to get stuff into Amblin. And I sent a resume on my own at first, but then he got me an actual direct interview. And uh, I don't know the inside story, but I kind of got fast track. So I was like the third employee they hired. I had the privilege shortly after being hired, they gave us a stack of still paper resumes at that point, literally about this thick, hundreds of resumes. And I had the pleasure of finding my own resume and getting to write on it. Yeah, forget this guy. He's, he's a joke. <laughs> and you know, passing that on. Um, but uh, yeah, it was the chance to work with Stephen again. And I worked with him. I actually worked with his sister a little bit who co-wrote the movie Big. Mm. Um, it was a project that never, never completed, but we did some interesting work based on a screenplay she had done that uh, Stephen came to us and said, yeah, I think this might work well as a game. And normally when I hear that, I cringe because it would be people who say, oh, there's lots of explosions in it. This will be fun for a video game. Right. This was a really interesting story that was great and I, gave me a little insight. In fact, she invited me to a, a uh, holiday party and I got to meet his parents at that party and one of uh, his other sisters. Oh, and wow. Really nice kind of getting a sense of what he was like as a person. So, um, so you think that uh, that idea held up as a, a good game idea? Do you, do you mind sharing what it was? Yeah, um, you know, I don't know. I've, I've, all these years later, I still want to keep whatever, sure. you know, security is. And it was a very psychological thing, but also a really interesting fantasy thing. I guess I can say that it involved people um, uh, being drawn into each other's dreams. And uh, years later, when um, Tim did Psychonauts, yeah. Uh, I mean, he he knew nothing about that, but I was thinking, yeah, I knew that was a good theme for a game. So, <laughs> do you think Spielberg's sister was like, ah, Tim Schafer? Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> there, there was. I mean, Hollywood is is very much like the parodies, except even more so. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, I interviewed uh, visiting Ubisoft Montreal years ago. I interviewed Max Spielberg. Spielberg's son. And I remember him saying, I think he was talking about how he spent so much time at DreamWorks Interactive, just kind of running around that studio back in the day. Do you remember him just as a kid? Wandering around so I, I 
didn't see him because our group, the the games group, was in a separate building at the time. Oh. But I I uh, first met Max on the phone at, at during those Last Crusade, um, uh, you know, puzzle sessions because oh, often wow. Stephen would play with Max on his lap. So I mean, he was brought into video games really early on, and uh, I think it was actually Ron who was on the phone with him when he got to the castle Grunwald where Indy puts on a Nazi uniform to sneak past the guards. And uh, apparently um, it, it's, it, Ron is listening to them, you know, talk and uh, says, yeah, we got to do this. And this, and all of a sudden he heard Max go, oh, and Stephen said, it's okay, Max. It's, okay. it's just a uniform. Indy's not a Nazi. He's not a Nazi. Oh, no. And, yeah. I just thought that was a wonderful moment that, that, you know, he, he misinterpreted what was going on there. <laughs> Obviously it didn't turn him off to video games. So I yeah. guess we didn't scar him too badly. <laughs> um, I mean, I feel bad for just, picking your brain for all these amazing people that you've met that have gone into such gigantic things. But uh, you worked with Giacchino, right? The composer of oh, every sure. movie known yeah. to man uh, back in the day at DreamWorks Interactive. So, so yeah, I mean, he had done a few games things and, um, you know, speaking of, of, of Spielberg having a good sense for recommendations. Yeah. Um, he heard uh, Michael's first uh, pass at some of the music and he said, this guy is great. He's like a young Johnny Williams. And in fact, that was incredibly prophetic. I mean, he's doing now. I mean, in fact, I just saw the latest um, uh, Tom Cruise Maverick Top Gun movie. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't until and I'm thinking, God, the, the composer did such a great job at capturing the feel of that first movie. And sure enough, Giacchino at the end of the thing. And <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, it's it, I just love the work he's done for I thought th what he did on The Incredibles in particular just blew me away as referencing every James Bond movie I'd ever seen and, and yet yeah. being really fresh and original. Do you remember working with him quite a bit back in the day? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we worked on several kids' projects, including one, um, and I guess I could say this on, on the air without publishing it, but he did several um, musical takes for a um, a game that we didn't make, and I've got one of the only cassettes tapes of these i mean i think he's probably still got it you know stored away somewhere but a couple of really beautiful um musical pieces to um uh it was called chalk talk uh and um he just I, he was great but we also worked together on um i think it was our small soldiers game yeah uh and and a um uh chaos island which was based on the lost world uh, and he uh, just he right then showed that he could take John Williams music and, you know, transform it, but make it still feel uh, like it like it was a good sequel. Yeah, I think the soundtrack in particular for like the Lost World game on PlayStation is still incredible, like divorced from the game. It's amazing. And Chaos um, Island. I'm, I'm amazed. You, well, I think you're probably thinking of there were several Lost World games. This one was actually a children's RTS game. Yes. No, no, that, I know. Uh, yep. I know yours. Oh, is a different. great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. I, I was really into RTS games. I still am. And I don't know how I missed Chaos Island, but I was going back to try and play it now. Is there any good way to play that game? It seems lost to time. I have no idea. I mean, I, there are people digging up everything. So my guess is that somewhere someone has figured out how to write, run into an emulator. And I bet if you dug, you could find it. I, it's something that, that fans have just amazed me at how deep that they go into recreating things. Uh, the, the World War II flight sims that I did with Larry Holland, yeah. uh, I mean, he was the main guy behind them, but I, I also hired Larry into LucasArts. Um, we released those and years later, somebody wanted to add different theaters of war, I think North Africa and different planes, and they reverse engineered it so they could hack all that stuff in. And I, so I'm just continually amazed at, at how much people, you know, love those games and are willing to uh, do anything they can to keep expanding them. Yeah, I heard you talk in other interviews about how Spielberg was mainly obsessed with those games in particular from your work, like World War II Flight Sims. That was his jam? Well, my, my favorite moment on that was uh, during my DreamWorks time, we had a meeting at his home office, which was a whole separate building, uh, just uh, detached from his, his home. And he had three books on the table of that office, um, stuff, and there were books he was looking into. I think Schindler's List was one of them. 
uh, gosh, another one could have been The Color Purple, some other book that he turned into a movie. But the third thing that was by far the most thumbed through and, and worn was the Secret Weapons of the Liftoff Manual. And I just love the fact that he, you know, yeah, I do those movies, but, you know, he, he went through that over and over again to play the game. So it's really <laughs> nice to see. That's sweet. Uh, we should probably talk about this uh, Fate of Atlantis. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, what about that? I uh, guess. Uh, when was the last time you played that game? Uh, quite a while ago. Um, I mean, I think I share with almost all of our, our, you know, group that we don't like go back and play them regularly. Ron replayed the Monkey Island games for the first time in a long time just for you know, return. Yeah. And probably, I don't know, 10 years ago, I would say, um, my daughter, uh, who uh, was too young when it came out, in fact, was born just before it came out, um, has married a game designer and programmer who, when he found out she'd never played Fate of Atlantis, he basically played it with her through the whole thing. And it was it was sort of a birthday present to me, and I'm still grateful for him for doing that. That's nice. um, but, you know, talking to her about her experience with it was was a big high point for me. Yeah. Did you have any complaints about any puzzles? <laughs> well, you know, the puzzles, in uh, something that a lot of people still don't understand, particularly in modern times, is that we were over and over again told, oh, I need 40 hours of gameplay in this. And we could not put 40 hours of original content in. So we had to make harder puzzles. We had to do mazes, which uh, I think there's a line in Return to Monkey Island about, oh, everybody hates mazes, <laughs> right. which was which is true. The players didn't like them. And even as developers, we didn't like them. But for programming time ratio versus amount of time people had to play them, they're, they were the best. And they said, all right, if you want 40 hours, you're going to have 10 hours of mazes in this game. So, <laughs> so it's just we were kind of stuck with it. The decree on high, because it kind of, Fate of Atlantis kind of ends with like two mazes uh, in a way, right? It's like, it's certainly, certainly a lot by the end there. Oh, by the way, real quick, um, in Return to Monkey Island, uh, no real spoilers here, but heads up everybody. Um, LeChuck towards the end is working on a puzzle that looks kind of like the three ring puzzle from Fate of Atlantis. You know if that was a direct reference to Fate of Atlantis or was it just, eh, that's just, you can only do so many puzzle designs. Uh, that's an interesting question. You know, I saw that. I think, I mean, it's it's certainly inspired more by the uh, decoder wheels that we had. Right. Um, you know, but, uh, I, you know, that's an interesting thought. Now, you know, neither, none of the other uh, people working on it besides the musicians worked on Fate of Atlantis, but, right. you know, they were familiar with it. My guess is that, no, it was just um, a kind of, parallel thinking. As I said, we, we all tend to think in very similar lines, having formed a lot of our creativity together. Yeah. And uh, it just, uh, you know, I, it didn't occur to me that it was a, an homage because okay. it seemed like the most logical way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Um, I'm curious about the rules of Indiana Jones as an IP back then. When you're telling an original story, you know, I've heard the tale about how it was originally you're looking at what the Chris Columbus script and then said, uh, F that, let's actually create something new. Let's go for Atlantis. Was there any, were there bullet points on a board of this is what Indiana Jones is and this is what he isn't? Or how much freedom did you have? So with Last Crusade, we met with both Stephen and George. And uh, the first time actually I met them both together, I think. Um, and that was our big question. You know, the uh, David Fox, Ron Gilbert, and I were the three project leaders on that. And we, we worked together as a team. We made a list of questions. And number one was, how far can we go with Indy? Could we kill him off in the game? Can we do stuff that isn't in the movie? And they both said, oh, do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> so we could kill him off. Yeah, sure. And in retrospect, it was, you know, these games uh, around that time, I was talking to the head of licensing at Lucasfilm and we had had a hit game. Maybe it was, in fact, Last Crusade a little later. Hit game came out. I said, hey, we're finally making some money for the company. And he he smiled in a pained way. I said, wasn't that good? I said, well, it's the best you guys have done. But I hate to say this, but we made more on licensing Star Wars pajamas alone than your entire division did last year. <laughs> and it's like, OK, that put us in our place. So and of course, now it's finally flipped around. But at the time, they didn't really care what we did. But uh, the positive side of it is that they understood the value of creative control and they just believed that we could handle it and we should do whatever was best we thought was best for our audience. Yeah. And I, I absolutely appreciated that. So we did that. not have a bullet list because they're basically it was one bullet, do whatever you like. 
<laughs> and that's how you end up with the end of spoilers, the end of Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, where Indiana Jones can become just a god and then fly into the camera and scream. Can you talk about that decision? It's so good. I was delighted. Well, I, you know, Hal and I spent a lot of time talking about uh, how to structure this, and and it was, you know, my biggest contribution was the multiple paths. But we both were really interested in allowing the interactivity to cause it to be different experiences for different people. And that kind of cried out for some different endings. And we hadn't really done it, you know, in a big way with Last Crusade. And this was an original story. So we figured we could do whatever we wanted. And it's not satisfying. You know, I think a lot of people play it through, get a positive ending and think, oh, you know, I guess you can't fail. And they go back to a save game to try and screw it up, thinking it'll be corrected. And it's like, oh, crap, you know, they can really, you know, Indy can can, become a demon, basically. (laughs) It's so good. Uh, I'm talking about, uh, I'm curious about Sophia um, Mm -hmm. as a character. When you came upon that idea of, oh, it'd be interesting to pair Indiana Jones with a psychic. Well, that was Hal's uh, thought was a psychic thing. Um, and that grew out of the research we did into Atlantis. In fact, on the, the bookshelf behind me, I've got some uh, Atlantis books on there. And uh, we really, we researched the hell out of it. And there is online somebody who deconstructed what we did. And I'm so pleased because this guy picked up on every single thing we put in, no matter how obscure, which amazed me. Wow. And there's like um, a bunch of Edgar Casey stuff and whatnot. Uh, oh, well, but yeah, but this goes back. It, it, interest in Atlantis goes back literally to, you know, Socrates and Plato and, you know, thousands of years. It was huge back around 1910 or so. And I'm wow. actually kind of curious, uh, been following the Gilded Age TV show, and it was a big thing in New York to have seances and talk to Atlantean spirits. And that was a lot of our, our um, impetus for Sophia. And you know, it, it, in her time in the 1930s, it wasn't quite as big, but there were a bunch of these people who were sort of mystics about that. And she was inspired by that quite a bit. And also by Marion Ravenwood, and that we felt that the, the, the women in the, the next two uh, movies weren't as much fun and were not as as you know, she was she was a real foil for for him, and we wanted somebody who would share in the adventures and who you could actually control because we we really cared about the women in the audience. And in fact, that game I think hit a high point of about forty percent women buying it, which was mm. huge in those days. Yeah, that's surprising. Um, I was all on board with Sophia until that sequence where I was trying to break her out of the prison. In Atlantis, and okay. she wouldn't go under the door, and Indiana Jones is screaming, and his legs are shaking. But it's like I feel like you all made everybody hate her because, like, just save me hours of puzzle solving. Just walk under the door right now, please. It's not fair to Sophia what you did to her. Is what I'm saying. Well, I, you know, I, th- I, I would, uh, you know, attribute that to the problem of the 40 hours and trying to make ah. it harder because shortcuts are are fun, but they mean that you finish the game faster and. You know, it was a, it was just a tough battle. The, the indie quotient stuff was also an idea I put forth in, in both of the indie games because it's a way to catch the completists, the ones who are most likely to complain about not being enough gameplay, were the ones who would try and get every last point. And we toyed for a while about saying there were 400 points, but only putting 399 oh, in the game. Oh, God. Um, but then we said, no, nah, we can't do that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I... I well, I shouldn't even give spoilers. Uh, I should say, I guess I'd say that I've just been watching She-Hulk on, on TV. Right. And the, there's a, an echo of that same kind of thinking in, in that uh, <laughs> TV show. Yep, definitely. Um, yeah, so I, I was curious too, at the end of Fate of Atlantis, at the end of the credits, it teases like, hey, maybe you'll see a younger Indiana Jones for the next adventure. What was the team's plan with that? Where were they going? <laughs> So, uh, again, Brian Moriarty had been working on uh, the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles was a TV series at the time. Yeah. And Brian Moriarty had been working on a fairly elaborate scum game uh, set in the, um, uh, God, what would it have been, the, the 1908 or something World's Fair, or no, it was 1916, I think, World's Fair in San Francisco uh, with um, Young Indiana Jones and kind of this the character that we had been introduced in this, uh, the TV series. And for various, I think, political and licensing reasons, they they decided not to. I mean, one of the interesting things is it took us as a group, um, I think, let's see, would have been seven years after the 
division was formed to do our first um, Indiana Jones or Star Wars license. And that was because partly because the licenses had at first been promised to other companies before we had a, our own group to do them, but largely also because we, the games division, had to pay a license fee to our licensing division, just like the external people did. Oh. We they they couldn't give us a break, um, just for various contractual legal reasons. I forget what the deal was. So when we did that, the company made money, but if an external team had done it they would have made the licensing fee for it and we could have made an original game and gotten all the money for that. And so financially it was generally a better deal not to make um, movie related stuff. But in fact, uh, last crusade and fate of Atlantis, I think was our high watermark for sales that it's possible that um, I think Grim Fandango might have, have rivaled it. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but uh, it was, enough of a success that it was worth using the license in that case. Oh, interesting. That's so complicated. Uh, I'm curious yeah. if you have thoughts on um, Todd Howard and Machine Games' upcoming Indiana Jones game that they announced not too long ago. Well, I was excited to see that it's coming out. I actually, you know, checked in with my contacts and said, hey, I'm available if you want to have some. Yeah. some and never heard back. So that was a little disappointing. Oh, come but, on, uh, Todd. <laughs> well, but the fact is, I am so busy in this stuff. And for all I know, um, you know, who knows, Ron may be he heavily working on that right now and keeping it secret. So, <laughs> That'd be sweet. Um, I mean, we'll be nice. see. But Water Under the Bridge, I'm looking forward to it. I'm glad that it's alive. You know, same deal with the, the canceled Indiana Jones that um, Lucasfilm was doing, uh, sorry, LucasArts was doing shortly before they were bought by Disney. I, I saw that at, uh, at uh, E3 and it looked really good. Oh, what was that one again? I don't remember that. One. It it I forget the name of it, but it featured um, uh, being able to damage stuff um, anywhere you wanted. So you could like have a car run into a building, and it would allow you to break through into the building. It was that sort mm. of thing, okay. uh, and a lot of other really interesting technical innovations. Gotcha. Um, I mean, there's no way that Todd Howard didn't play Fate of Atlantis. Like, it would it would make sense chronologically to have Sophia in that new game. I mean, <laughs> would that be a tip of the cap? Would you like them to include some Easter eggs in there? Cause well, there has to be so some Hal, Easter egg. Hal did Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine and included Sophia, yeah, you know, yeah. so he kind of carried it on there. And Sophia, uh, you know, Hal did the, the you know, large majority of the writing for Fate of Atlantis. I was focusing more on some of the, the game design and puzzles and structure and did some writing, but uh, you know, not a, not a huge amount. And Sophia and her, particular personality was a lot of his doing that way so was, I, I consider him the one who has the best rights to you know yeah. playing with her and I, I love her as a character I still think it was a fun character and, and quirky in an interesting way Hal taught me so much about creating uh, interesting cinematic characters that I still use to this day yeah I'm curious what you think about um, George Lucas seemingly from the outside not being as involved with the new Indiana Jones movie Indy 5 um, what do you think about that for a strategy <laughs> Well, you know, I, it's always complicated. Uh, you know, the the rumors you hear out of Hollywood, I've learned to take with a huge grain of salt. Yeah. You know, our, the stuff they said about our games and, you know, oh, they're working on a movie based on this game or whatever. Um, a lot of there was sometimes a kernel of truth there. But for the most part, a lot of stuff was just, you know, either fans or some misreporting or just a, a honest mistake kind of gone gone nuts um so i don't know i, I basically i'm going to wait until it comes out and if george talks about it i'll believe that but sure. otherwise we'll see and i think he's probably i mean he's doing a lot of other stuff and you know he, he's kind of i uh, moved on in some areas besides which they said he was totally uninvolved with a lot of the uh, TV stuff, and then we see him on the Mandalorian set later on. So, right? Yeah. As I say, I, I, I wouldn't wouldn't believe any of that stuff until it's all done. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right for sure. Um, could we jump a little bit in time? Uh, I would love to talk. By the way, I mean, I'm sure every interview with you is just like Slaughterhouse Five, just jumping through time. Here it must be so bizarre. <laughs> but um, I am curious about your time at Google and specifically your perception of the earliest days of Stadia. Because I think I heard you say you were what, like the second person on that team, something like that. Oh no, no, I knew it when it was a two-person team, ah, okay, uh, uh, or at least there were, there were just two people in charge and doing most of the work. Um, and uh, boy, let me recalibrate. I tell you, four years at Google, and you learn to be super careful about what you say, uh, particularly because 
my title was chief game designer. That was a sort of a gift from, from my friend RJ. Uh, but it wasn't a C-level organization. And yet on the outside, people said, oh, chief, you must be like a chief operating officer. Right. And that meant that if I said something about the company that, you know, I said, oh, yeah, I think the stock will be really good this year then, uh, you know, they could get sued for hundreds of millions of dollars. And at any rate, so that said, um, I saw the earliest versions, earliest, not even earliest, but very early versions of Stadia. I got to test it some way back in like 20, 2013. Uh, and it was, I was already able to play games on my home television with nothing but something that looked just like a Chromecast that I could plug into it. And I was blown away because it just was great. And they had a whole bunch of stuff they had to work through, obviously, before they finally launched it. Uh, and it changed code names twice in the time I was at, at Google. Um, but, uh, you know, I thought it was an interesting idea. Uh, they were aiming at big um, FPS games primarily, and I've never been a huge fan of those. It just isn't my my favorite type of game, so I didn't spend a lot of time with it. But I was just blown away of being able to play a game on a remote computer with as little latency as they had even in 2013. Um, yeah. And, you know, I was rooting for them because as chief game designer, I ended up getting involved with most of the game work that was going on in the company, the early versions of their, their VR and AR stuff and a whole bunch of projects that nobody outside of Google ever heard of, but were, were really fun. Several of the games that were put into Google Doodles, I uh, got to test and give them some feedback on those. So it was a really fun position to kind of be a, a you know, a game designer without portfolio within the company. Yeah. Did you get to offer advice for, you know, potential studios to acquire, talent to bring in, talent to connect the dots with? At various times, yeah. My role changed dramatically over the time I was there. Uh, and I never got to be, I was supposed to be head of uh, the design arm of a 200-person Android studio making high-level Android games. That was what we actually came in to do. But Andy Rubin, who had that idea, it turned out had been, you know, harassing people and was, you know, quietly shuffled out of the company, which I didn't know until like three years after I'd left Google. I mean, it was done very quietly and nobody in the company wanted anything to do with his, his projects after that. So yeah. um, unfortunately they never built the studio. Um, but yeah, we were actually talking to a Chicago studio to acquire, to be the core of our game studio. Um, but that, as I say, didn't work out. Was it uh, your friends at high voltage? Uh, no, it was not. Okay. Somebody else. Right on. Um, yeah, what's <laughs> oh, this is the thing. Those are the kinds of things that Google has taught me. I should not say. You know, <laughs> I, I yeah. technically probably shouldn't have even said this much, but it's water under the bridge now. Yeah. What is your takeaway? What is the what is the lesson from the Stadia journey? I mean, it's such a bizarre thing from the outside to see you know, GDC 2019 CEO get up there on stage and be like, "We are taking gaming seriously. Believe in us, Stadia, everybody." And then. It's exactly what yeah. Predicted. Well, in fact, when when I was hired, uh, there was this nice uh, article in was it Fortune, you know, one of the big magazines, saying the title was "Is Is, is Google Taking Games Seriously?" Right. And the, people keep asking that question, and they keep saying, "Yes, we are," and then doing this sort of thing. So, yeah. I, I, it it's been public that the company has had an issue with the fact that they tend to, if you're in the company, you get more credit and promotion uh, for launching stuff than you do for just maintaining something that has been launched. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue I think that a lot of the big tech companies have. Uh, but Google in particular, and I appreciate this about the company, they are willing to put out, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of different experiments all the time and know that the vast majority will fail. Uh, it's just sad when they put, you know, literally, you know, tens or hundreds of millions into something and it doesn't work out, uh, but they can afford to do that lots and lots of times before they run out of money. Yeah. Um, do you feel burned out at all by big companies after experiences with, you know, Lucas and Google? Or are you just kind of like, eh, you just you can't operate efficiently? Well, I mean, it was after uh, some experiences that were frustrating at DreamWorks that yeah. sent me off to be a freelancer. Um, but I've kind of come to terms with that. You know, I'm, you know, advanced enough in my career now and I'm very happy in this niche I found that it, that just doesn't affect me. And I'm, I'm actually working with a different one of the Fang companies, I guess is as far as I'll say, because they're just as tight as, as Google is about this sort of thing. Um, and the bureaucracy is just a, a pain in the butt, but 
I'm just really glad that I don't have to be part of it as an employee anymore. Yeah. Right on. Well, hey, Noah, uh, thanks for your full career. I look forward to seeing, <laughs> you know, the next phase. What could possibly be next? It's a fascinating journey you've been on. Thank you. It's been a, a great interview, and I particularly appreciate, I think my favorite point here was the um, Slaughterhouse-Five reference. That was a really <laughs> nice, archaic, uh, but appropriate reference to, to throw in there. Oh, good. I'm happy to help. And obviously, fingers crossed for some revival of Fate of Atlantis. If, if you have the context at Disney, which it sounds like you do, that's nice to hear that maybe there's a discussion happening somewhere. Uh, well, you know, I... I I can honestly say that I don't know anything about it, but yeah. if they, and I'll say this publicly now, if they do a, a, a remake of Fate of Atlantis, I would be quite offended not to be involved in that one. So I, <laughs> I hope they consider that. I hope Craig is listening to this. Awesome. Cool. Well, hey, thanks again for your time, Noah. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you so much for watching or listening to this interview from MinMax. You can always subscribe to our YouTube channel for plenty more like it. Check out that playlist. There's a lot happening there, but hey, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much, folks. Bye. You've seen the headlines. You know that the media landscape is consolidating. Having truly independent games media is more important than ever. MinMax can exist independently as a place about games, friends, and getting better, but we need your help. The good news is that it's easy. Just click on that subscribe button or unlock a mountain of benefits by going to patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. Thanks so much, everybody.